Liberals and revolutionaries collude and oppose one another, as we see in the confrontation between Stepan Tropinovich and his son, Pyotr Stepanovich. Stepan's former charge, Stravogin, is a troubled soul, and he is caught between those revolutionaries and liberals who want him and the potential love interest with Lisa. The chief action of the novel and its chief political interest is the revolution afoot and the cowardly way in which the liberals of the novel abet the revolution. If you want to understand modern revolution, this is the part of the novel that is one of the best places in Western literature to look. Yet, there is a deeper stratum of the novel, namely what the alternative to modern revolution is and what the alternative to modern science as a way of organizing society is. The deepest stratum of the novel concerns the battle over Stravogin's soul and the battle over other souls, at least those who have been estranged from the modern reformist movement. And here I would submit, Stepan Tropinovich and Shatov, the lover of his people, are as important as Stravogin. We will see all this as we proceed. I think we need to take stock in this video and see what has happened in part one before we proceed to the main action of the novel. I think that the best way to take stock is to see who is coming to this town and who has always been there. We have established characters, people with reputations and roots, so to speak, in this town. And we have a slew of people converging on the town to make mischief and for other reasons. Our narrator mentions that the true action of the novel really only begins in part one, chapter four, section seven. This day was one of the most pretentious in my chronicle. It was the day of the unexpected, a day of the unraveling of the old and the raveling up of the new, a day of sharp explanations and of a still deeper muddle. I think we can orient ourselves through seeing the comings into the town and into seeing the establishment of the town. First, politically. The mild old governor has been replaced with a new governor, von Lemke. Much was falling apart under this old mild governor, the man whose ear Stravogin had bitten. As we learn later, our soft former governor had left the administration in some disorder. At the present moment, cholera was approaching. There had been a great loss of cattle in some parts. First had raged all, fires had raged all summers in towns and villages. And among the people, there was a murmuring about arson, more and more taking root robbery had increased twice over its previous scale. Von Lemke, the new governor, and his wife, Yulia Mikhailovna, are coming to town. Von Lemke has the reputation for competence and a bit more toughness. A reformer, to be sure, but one who recognizes the importance of order to reform. His wife, Yulia, is a social climber. These are the liberals whom the chief revolutionaries will exploit in their effort to turn the town over. The other great liberal we see in part one who has come to town is the author, Karmazinov, modeled apparently after Ivan Turgenev. He wants the approval of the revolutionaries like the governor's wife, Yulia. And Karamazov is obsessed with the recognition that he thinks he has earned as a great novelist. Other liberals, however, are already in the town, and they too play a role in the revolution. These liberals are younger, and they are in the orbit of Stepan Trepinovich. Consider them a men's group with not a little imbibing done on Vavara's dime. This was a long-standing group. It included Liputin, a man without a patronym, a great liberal, and known around town as an atheist. A bit of a patriarch in the old school, willing to keep his family under his thumb. He is also an undisguised gossip, 
who must always know the doings about town. This liberal, a longtime friend of Stepan, will participate in the murder of our nationalist Shatov, though with a bad conscience. Another liberal in the town is Virginsky, a civil servant whose sister and wife all entertain the latest convictions. They are all revolutionaries, and they speak of that hilariously later in a meeting at Virginsky's birthday. Virginsky was mainly self-taught, so this reading group with Stepan was something important to him. He too will participate in the revolutionary Sal as one of the five who murder Shatov. Another liberal in this group is a man that our narrator usually refers to as the Jew, Limashin, or a little Jew, Limashin. He is a merchant of sorts, and he too will participate in the murder of Shatov. So the liberals who come to town abet the revolution, while many of the liberals situated in the town, at least these three, like Putin, Virginsky, and Limashin, participate in the main action of the revolution, though they may feel guilty about it. Also converging on the town are some shadowy figures, including Lebyadkin, his sister Maria Timofeevna, and Fedka the convict. Fedka is from the town, and Stepan sold Fedka out of serfdom to cover Stepan's debts. Lebyadkin is very much a disreputable figure, adding chaos to the town. He is often drunk and he had known the great and the good who had left this one-horse town when they went away to college. Maria is not shadowy exactly, and she turns out to be married to Stravogin. All of these characters bring darkness and confusion to the town. Two older women are the most grounded in the town, Vavara, Stepan's patroness and friend, and Praskovia Ivanovna, the twice-widowed mother of Lisa. Lisa, too, who is from the town and has lived here as a youngster, though like the older ladies, she went to boarding school before returning to town. A kind-hearted former serf, Daria or Dasha, Vavara's servant, is also someone who hasn't strayed over much from the town. Vavara hasn't left for a while, though Preskovna Ivanovna, Lisa, and Daria are just returning from a spell in Switzerland, where they had met Stravogin. Shatov is a complicated case, and we will talk more deeply about him in video 7. For now, let us just say that Shatov was Vavara's serf, but he was freed and went to school. He was kicked out of school and joined a revolutionary movement abroad. He even went to America to see what life was like there. But he gave up on America, and it changed his political opinions radically. He had come to love Russia and to be an advocate for Russia. He came back to his hometown and was again part of Stepan's men club with the liberals, always bristling at their ideas and worried that they would cancel him, as we say today. But the members of that liberal circle never cancel Shatov. Stepan especially loves Shatov and is kind to him at every turn. We see all of this in 118, page 29 and following. Shatov knew Stravogin as a young man, presumably, since they both grew up in the same house. Shatov knew Stravogin in Petersburg when they both went to school. Shatov knew Stravogin in Switzerland and got more than a little help from Stravogin on his return from America. Lots of people are returning to their roots, Lisa and Shatov especially. Many had earlier returned to their roots, Vavara and her old boarding school friend especially. Pyotr and Stravogin are also coming back to town. It's a big reunion of the old and the new. And this reunion is what happens at the end of part one. Here we see that Vavara has gone to church. She meets Yulia, the new governor's wife, who is at church with Lisa, 
Julia's niece. Maria Timofeevna is there too, and she wants to go home with Vavara, who, unbeknownst to Vavara, is her mother-in-law, or through the daughter-in-law. Lisa, who had loved Stravogin abroad, and was then spurned for some reason, leaves her aunt and insists on going home with Vavara and Maria, and all three of them arrive home. At the same time, Stepan arrives with our narrator, and in order to hear whether or not he will be marrying Daria is the reason he came home. So Stepan is there to hear about his fate. He arrives too. Then, shock of shockers, Pyotr and Stravogin come back home and they come in. It's a bit of a freak show. Pyotr talks endlessly about nothing. Vavara asks Stravogin whether he is married to this lame girl, Maria. Stravogin does not answer, but leads Maria out of the room and takes her home. When Stravogin returns, Pyotr has talked the ears off of everyone. And then one of the most important things in part one happens, right at the conclusion, when Shatov slaps Stravogin hard, and then Lisa faints and nearly hits her head. Precisely why Shatov slaps Stravogin, we don't know. I think we are led to believe that Shatov thought Stravogin had violated Shatov's sister, had been in love with Shatov's wife, all the while in Switzerland. And this is what Lisa certainly thinks in any event. But we will have to learn more about this as we proceed through our analysis of these characters. Something is afoot in this town for sure. We don't yet know what is afoot. We will get a much clearer picture in part two.